Rosamund Pike, Lindsay Hilson, welcome to the program. Thank you. I don't know whether you think about this in, in real time, but it could not be better time, the, this movie, and frankly your book as well, since it does highlight Marie's life, but in the context of the severe danger that we journalists are under, and people like Marie obviously was. What do you think about what's going on right now with the you know, horrific story of Jamal Khashoggi? I mean, I think we, we, you know, Matthew Heinemann, the director, and I are both very, very proud that this is a film that really celebrates journalism. You know, that, that is a hymn to the, to the, to the danger, the real, very real danger that journalists put themselves in. And I, I'm not sure that everybody is fully aware of that. Um, you know, it struck me actually, um, reading Lindsay's book, that in around 2004, five, the Sunday Times was having to quickly recalibrate mm. and start almost, you imply, almost the editor started reading books on, on the effects of, of repeated exposure to conflict. Yeah, PTSD and all, yeah, exactly. Um, mm. And now here we have it, obviously from the Washington Post this time, of, of a journalist again who has lost his life in, in pursuit of his truth or in for speaking out his truth. Yeah, um, no, I mean, it is extraordinary. And you obviously are a foreign correspondent and a war correspondent. And you've written the book on, on Marie in Extremis. And you've had amazing access to her diaries. But you also know what, what Rosamond has learned to know by playing this singular character. Well, I think that the extraordinary thing about Marie, people often say that Marie was fearless. She wasn't really fearless, but she could always overcome her fear because she was so motivated. She was so highly motivated to tell the story of victims of war. And that was conscripts as well. There was nothing Marie liked more than sitting in a muddy trench with a bunch of soldiers and finding out what was going on. But she, she did think about her own safety. But, you know, I often worked alongside Marie but her danger threshold was far beyond mine. And she always went in further and stayed longer. That was why she got the best stories. That was why she's not with us today. Mm. Mm. What did you think as you were assimilating the character to play her? I mean, you know, what Lindsay says is, is, is really true. And, you know, it's what Jamal did, you know, speak out against his government. You know, Marie and other journalists were in Syria saying things that were seen by the Assad regime in real time. Uh, particularly since she gave interviews to cable news and radio and, and all the rest of it. How did you compute for yourself as, as an outsider to news, but as yes. the actress playing this very brave, kind of edgy frontiers woman? I love the way you say that. Um, I, 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 Marie had extraordinary empathy. And, and, and what always interested her was the, was the human cost of war. And I, I think in terms of our film, I think it's very interesting because the depiction of Middle Eastern people in Hollywood movies tends to be as the outsider, the other, sometimes the extremist, the fanatic. That, that, that's the sort of traditional role. And here is a movie which goes into and delves into the pain of the people in these conflict regions, um, particularly the Syrian people. We go with Libyan people, people in Iraq. Um, and that's not a portrait that many people in the West are often given on film. And it's something I'm quite proud of. And I think Marie would have applauded too. We're going to start actually with one of the clips now, because it is when she's actually meeting photographer Paul Conroy for the first time, who was with her to the end in Syria. But this is in Iraq, and she's doing her typical thing, wanting to meet up and collaborate with the best of the best. So let us just play this and we'll talk about it. What's your name? Paul. I'm Marie. I know. So you're freelance? Always. Any good? The best. Paul, the photographer, yes. also, I think, worked with you on the script and as a consultant and all the rest of it. What did you gain from, from, from meeting the people who she not just knew but worked in the field with? Plus, how did you get that uncannily accurate depiction of her? Well, that's very nice. Um, I mean, M Marie was, a, was an amazing person, an, an inimitable presence, and I knew that in playing her, I had to, I had to inhabit her. It wasn't just, I, I couldn't just play a war correspondent. I had to play her. Also, my director was a documentary maker, and I knew that probably in an ideal world, he would be making a documentary about Marie, which sadly he can't. And I knew I had to deliver something that would be as close to the authentic as, as, mm. as I could. So I knew that involved changing the way I walked, changing the way I spoke, changing the way I learned to smoke, 
<laughs> oh, she Which did a lot she did of that. A lot. Did you um, learn to drink vodka martinis as well? I could learn, yeah, learn to make, mix, drink, <laughs> yeah, all, all of the above. And, uh, and Paul Connery came with us, I think, just to check out what we were doing for about a week and to get us up, up on our feet. And then I, I think he found in, in our profession uh, something akin to the sort of sense of a traveling band on the road, you know, with people mm -hmm. where there's a sort of urgent sense of intimacy because you're having to create something that, you know, delves deep into the human condition in a short space of time. And it's that fast track intimacy that I'm sure mm. people in your profession find as well. And I think he enjoyed it and he stayed with us and actually became our on-set stills photographer, which was, you know, probably a bit of a sort of light relief for him, really. But um, yeah. it was very, very valuable to have him around because he shared, he, got, he gave a real sense at all times of Marie and Paul's, you know, their camaraderie, of her, of the moments that she'd go dead quiet because she experienced the fear that Lindsay was talking about. Um, I agree with you, definitely not fearless. Mm -hmm. The real courage is feeling it and going there anyway. Yeah. I mean, quick, quick, you've seen a clip mm -hmm. or two. How does Rosamund measure up as Marie? <laughs> it's actually quite, <laughs> it's oh actually God. the first time I saw it, it was quite painful because the thing that Rosamund has done, which is so weird for me, is she's got the way Marie moved, moved, you know, it's this sort of spiky, angular thing. And it, it, it really did feel like Marie was there. And it was that more than anything else. I mean, yes, the face, the eye patch, the voice, but it's the way she moved. And that is what was so extraordinary for me, watching it. Very and, strange. And, and given, given where we are in the story, you, you know, you worked mm. alongside her many times, I did as well, and you have had unbelievable access to her most intimate thoughts through her diaries since she was 13 years old. As we move along with mm. this story, <laughs> give us a little idea of, of who she was and how she became oh, this well, it, person. It's, it's so extraordinary for me. I mean, I think in writing the biography, one of the most extraordinary moments for me was when I found this diary of hers, little white plastic closed with a key and I had to slit it open and I realized, oh my God, nobody has opened this since Marie at the age of 14 locked it. And in, Enjoy. yes, and, but then, oh, she was naughty. Oh, she was rebellious. <laughs> and so she's brought up on Long Island, middle-class family, Catholic family, mass every Sunday. And I think one of my favorite entries, it just goes to church, warm mini, the mother and the father no like. <laughs> oh, I felt that in that rebellious little girl, I saw the woman she became who I knew. Well, I, I, I want to fast forward to a dramatic mm. towards the end of her life, and I want to play one of the very last dispatches she gave from Homs, which was to Anderson Cooper, and, and it became really sort of seminal. Let's just play it. It's a complete and utter lie that they are only going after terrorists. There are rockets, shell, tank shells, um, anti-aircraft being fired in a parallel line into the city. The Syrian army is simply shelling the city of cold, starving civilians. She was in Baba Amma, one of the suburbs uh, outposts of Homs, and she insisted on staying. And that's part of a whole sort of controversy between her and Paul and the editors and people who look at, uh, who look at what happened to her in the end. It's a pivotal moment in the film. Mm -hmm. What was going through your mind? I mean, you're playing her, you've assimilated so much, and yet, you know, it's it's some some people might say that determination to stay is what cost her her life yes you know it's funny you know my heart's racing just I, I haven't been nervous sitting here and then we play that and somewhere in my body I go back to the feelings that I inhabited playing Marie at that time in uh, in, in her life um, and actually she was in Homs they uh, they understood that, that a big assault was coming and and it was necessitous to go to leave they were halfway down this storm drain this four kilometer storm drain which was the entry and exit point for any journalist coming in to homs taken by the fsa fighters and she was sort of halfway down or a few hundred meters down it and she said i've got to go back you know there are twenty-eight thousand people there and i can't abandon them and um and paul said to her you realize if we go back we will die and she said i have to go back you know this is what we do this is what we do. And she went back and he, of course, followed her because he wasn't going to leave her. And um, and he told me, actually, that, that they I find this very emotional. So mm. forgive me. Um, but he he said that they both 
felt very strongly that they might not make the deadline for the Sunday Times that week. And that was her decision, that motivated her decision to ask Sean Ryan if she could broadcast with CNN and Channel 4 and wherever, BBC, yeah. BBC. And she and, called um, me. And she, and yeah, she spoke she called, to you. She called me. She called me. And I said, and I was furious with her. I was furious. I said, Marie, why did she go back? And she said, Lindsay, it's the worst thing we've ever seen. And I said, I know, but, you know, what's your exit strategy? And she said, that's just it. We don't have one. I'm working on it now. And then a few hours later, she was killed. Again, in this moment that we are living, we all remember so starkly where, where we were when we heard that Marie had been killed in 2012. And now, six years later, you have so many others have been killed in the last six years trying to do this kind of work. But all of a sudden, the world is focused on Jamal Khashoggi because he wasn't a war correspondent, but he was taking on and criticizing a very powerful regime. And again, until we find out exactly what happened to him, we can only assume the worst of what's been leaked. But there is that whole similar attitude that I cannot be silenced. I will not be silenced, whether it's Marie because of the danger, whether it's Jamal because of the threats he was getting from, from the Saudi regime and others. I wonder whether people understand that that's what we do for but them. I, but I think that the other thing which is really important is that, you know, Marie was killed in Syria and James Foley and others, but the majority of journalists killed in Syria are Syrians. And I think that that is so important, that the majority of journalists under threat all over the world are under threat from their own governments and from mm. organized criminals. Mm. Um, today is the anniversary of the killing of Daphne Caruana Galizia. She was a, a Maltese journalist mm. who was investigating corruption. Yeah. And she and two other journalists within the European Union have been killed this year. And they are not, they're not in war zones. They're investigating corruption and organized crime. And that, it seems to me, is this really important I don't know if it's new, but it's a front in this war on journalists. And I think that's why this film and your book at this time are really, really significant and, and major reminders of what's at stake here, not just for the individuals who are targeted and who lose their, life, lose their lives, but for our very democracies, for our whole idea of what's truth and what's lies. And again, about Marie, we had her sister and her lawyer on, Kat right. and, her, and her lawyer, who are convinced that this was not an accident, she was not killed in any crossfire, that no. she, was, uh, she was in fact uh, targeted. And I interviewed them when they came out with their conclusions in their suit against the Assad regime. Mm -hmm. And Kat explained to me that she'd been talking to Paul Conroy. Let's just listen to this. Yeah. Really, it felt right from the beginning like it had to be deliberate. The coincidence of her reporting out of home just the night before she was killed uh, was too much of a coincidence. But it really hit home when I spoke to Paul Conroy uh, about his uh, knowledge of the artillery fire and how he was absolutely certain that the pattern of fire was one of targeting, not random uh, bombings as they'd experienced in the, in the weeks uh, leading up to Marie's murder. Um, so I really felt from the outset that it was deliberate. You say it? Go ahead. We say, and we say that in the film. I mean, as, as uh, as we leave the media center in Homs under fire in the final moments of the film, the Paul character played by Jamie Dornan says to me, you know, they're, they're bracketing, they found us. And Marie says, what's that? And he says, they've, you know, they're measuring the distance and they're closing in on our location. They know exactly where we are. And, so in, the, and in the last chapter of the book, I talk about the other evidence of the court case, which is of defectors and spies. There was quite a lot of evidence. So do you, you think that this is a solid case? There's someone who's actually spoken out. Yeah, 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 yeah there are, yeah, uh, an intelligence a, official. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of evidence. Okay, so the next question is, much with the Saudi regime right now, do you think that either Marie's death or Jamal's death will result in the guilty being held accountable? Oh, I wish I could say yes. I, I think that I believe that in the end, the guilty will be held accountable. But I don't know how far away the end is, because right now I feel that journalism is really under threat. And I think that if it is established that Jamal Khashoggi was murdered, if it is established that he was murdered for being a journalist and speaking out, then I really hope that governments and people within Saudi Arabia do react and, and do something. Uh, and can we just point out that six years after Marie's death, and she was reporting from the very beginning of the war, 
uh, it looks like Assad is on the verge of not just winning, but being accepted as the winner. And we need to really compute this. We really do need to just think about it for the moment because it costs 500,000 lives at the very least of Syrians and millions of refugees uh, and obviously so many more wounded. But I want to play because this film is called A Private War. So it's not just about Marie's war work. It's also about her internal war with herself. And she had, as you know, we mm. know a lot of PTSD. She was a heavy drinker. She had a couple of miscarriages. She had failed marriages. She had suicide. She had divorce. She had just so much going on in her, in her own life as she was nonetheless conducting this work at a very high level. And I just want to play Marie accepting an award back in 2000, and then mm. Marie talking to Paul in the film when she's actually at one of the rehabilitation clinics. The pain of war is really beyond telling. Um, I don't think I've ever filed a story and felt I got it. Uh, I really said what I want people to feel, um, but I do try. And I think whatever the rights and wrongs of a conflict, I feel we fail if we don't face what war does, um, face the human horrors, rather than just record who won and who lost. I fear growing old. <laughs> and I also fear dying young. I'm most happy with a vodka martini in my hand, but I can't stand the fact that the chatter in my head won't go quiet until there's a quart of vodka inside me. I hate being in a war zone. But I also feel compelled. Compelled to see it for myself. Mm. So it's really real. Yeah, I think, I think in order to I think Matthew and I both felt that in order to, you know, really do Marie justice, we needed to go into the depths of her soul. And I think, you know, I'm very, very interested in the cost of doing any job at a high level, um, whether it's sport or whether it's mm. what you do. Um, and I think, you know, it, I think it's a very complicated place for the war correspondent because I'm sure you must feel when you're out there, you're exposed to so much trauma and so much of other people's pain. There must be a part of you that thinks, well, why am I feeling? Because it's not my pain to feel. Yes. And yet you must feel. You cannot be exposed mm. to that level of trauma without feeling. So where on earth does it go? Um, and then you probably feel sort of guilty, wrongly, for, for having it haunt you because I think it's a very complicated position to occupy. And um, I think it was very lonely. And I'm sure you feel that you should be able just to pull yourself together when you're back on the I think, But I think it is also, I mean, one of the reasons I called the book In Extremis is because it was a quote from Marie. She said, I, what I write about is people you know, living in extremis and what really happens in war. But obviously, she also lived her own life yes. in extremis. Yes. That, that was it. But I suppose I also want to say, because this is all serious stuff, she was the best company. She was the funniest person. Yeah. I said, you know, I used to think of us as the Thelma and Louise of the press corps, <laughs> you know, because whenever I, you know, I would be anywhere, Marie would turn up and I'd go, Whew. well, now, you know, I'm going to have fun. And there was an occasion, and that we're not supposed to joke about these things now, but there was an occasion when uh, we were uh, on a stage and a very earnest young woman got up and said, you know, how do you cope with the trauma? And Marie turns to me and she says, well, she says, Lindsay and I, we go to bars and we drink. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, oh, God. Yeah. You know, and that's, what do we call it? Black humor. Rosamund Pike, thank you so much. <laughs> Lindsay Hilson, thank you very much. Yeah. A Private War and In Extremis.